Hey everyone, I'm Rather Go here. It's back with another video about the Hunters of the Mythos. It turns out I'm not just running one team in this. When I told my tabletop group about my serial team, they really wanted to try to compete in and win in whatever the most popular bracket was. So while in my serial run, I ultimately decided it was a bigger flex to go with Harvey, they're like, no, 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 if doping's allowed, every athlete who wants to win should be doping. We're not running taboo. If their stated goal is let's try to win by a landslide, I don't really think we can. I think realistically the top couple teams are all going to be within like a few points of each other, very close to the maximum score. But you know, if you aim for the moon, you'll land among the stars and all that. I appreciate the spirit. So let's talk about what we're going to be doing in the Hunters of the Mythos challenge run to try, or not challenge run, competition, to try to win. What do we think if you're just playing through the Forgotten Age and trying to win as aggressively as possible, what do you do? And to talk about that, we need to talk about what you get the points from. And to a lesser degree, other stuff, like how do you handle weaknesses? Because that's actually fairly important, and I will get into that in a little bit. But getting down to points is the most important thing for this. Because you can't just win by making the best team. The best team doesn't really matter for beating the campaign or getting the most victory. What matters is criteria on points. And coming all the way down to the scoring system, you'll see that pretty much every scenario says half a point for every location in play, half a point for every location with no clues. So you're not just trying to get all the victory locations like normal, where you'll see a location with no clues and think to yourself, I can walk past this, I'll get what I need to progress at a location that doubles as victory points. You have to get all the clues to get max points. You'll also see stuff like three points for reaching resolution one, minus one point for each doom. Eh, I combined fourth and point to one word, don't know how I did that but minus one fourth for each doom on a location, so doing it faster and failing less tests will result in a higher score as well. And I think the big wins that really change it from just like full completion with more clues than normal to something else is you get eight bonus points for full completing Boundary Beyond. That's really hard to do. Although to be fair, full completing Forgotten Ages first scenario is also really hard to do. People who normally get full victory on that scenario have looked at the map and realized that the first three locations are basically useless and there's no reason to get clues at them. Getting all the clues at all the locations in this first scenario is actually really hard, but full completing Boundary Beyond is harder. And if you look at the maximum number of points you can get in part one of Heart of the Elders, which is also next to impossible. Every time I've played that scenario, it's been like a rat race to get out alive. So I don't think you can full complete this, but even if you did, you'd come out one point lower than the bonus for completing this entirely in one go. So that's a big thing you wanna aim for. It's a fairly random scenario, don't know if we can get it, but it's a thing to aim for. And then coming down all the way to the end to bonus points, there's some extra things going on. This two points for each investigator who was never poisoned, we don't, after talking about this, we probably got about four or five hours of just talking about Forgotten Age and investigators where we were really discussing what to do with this and looking at different characters and even test playing the first scenario with our intended team, we don't think you can control this. First of all, every character has multiple auto-fail chances to get poisoned throughout a campaign, just period, end of story. Some people will get multiple extra points, and those who do will almost certainly be people who have good mythos stats and cards like Word of Protection to minimize the amount of times they get poisoned. It's possible that that means the best teams will be playing Mystics, or even someone like Agnes, who has four copies of Ward. But we ended up thinking that any team running a Mystic, unless they were a four-player team, maybe, we weren't really sure about like how you would optimize a four-player team, and there are three of us, so it's sort of out of our ballpark anyway. We didn't really think this was in our hands. We thought this was like, probably we're gonna get two points for it, because one of our characters likely gets away without getting poisoned, but I doubt we can really control that. The Harbinger of Elusia getting killed early would be a cool thing to go for, but as we'll get into later, this last one is really the only one that matters where you're going to get some bonus points if you kill it in Depths of Yoth when it shows up for the last time. Then we looked through the prowess options, and this is the really big one, where if you look at all the different options, you can see there are a couple of 20-point options with Yipikai Yig and Expedish Exposition. And then there are two 15-point options with Bear Grylls and SPN. So obviously you want the 20-point ones, right? But the 20-point win requires you to have Max Vengeance, which means you go right into the final part of Depths of Yoth, and as far as I can tell, that's basically going to lose you more than the five point difference between this and the other options. I don't really imagine there's a way around that. It's possible that there is like some really busted characters with infinites, but even then the sheer number of enemies, like you'd have to set up a team that could deal with the entire Mythos deck every turn 
to not lose out on the five points or more from spawning that way. I don't think the max points will ever come from this. And then going to Expeditus Expedition, I started just like counting the total number of rounds in each agenda, assuming every copy of Ancient Evils went off once. And I got to like within 15 of the limit at the start of Depths of Yoth, assuming that you full complete Boundary Beyond. And I was like, guys, we have 15 turns compared to the maximum amount. We're trying to full clear more than we normally do. There's no way we're doing the last two scenarios in that time limit. I honestly don't know that this is achievable, but if it is achievable, I think you're leaving a lot of points on the table to make it happen. And I think it's gonna be worth less than 15 at the end of it because of what you give up to accomplish your goal. Which leaves us with Snake Protection Agency and Bear Grills. Bear Grills means you have some other issues throughout the campaign. Most notably, all the trauma you're taking and all the scenarios you start down three resources. The other stuff isn't as big of a deal, but you will probably end up leaving points on the table due to bad starts of scenarios because you can't buy provisions. I personally think that this is probably wrong, but honestly it's just a feeling and it might end up being better than Snake Protection Agency. So as a result, we think Snake Protection Agency is really the only achievable one where you're not going to give up more points than you get, or more accurately, where you're going to get the most points after the things it costs you. Because Snake Protection Agency is not really 15 points. There will be Vengeance locations that go into the victory display and cost you Snake Protection Agency, so you'll have to leave. I know there's at least half a point in the second scenario. I think there are some more locations like this, though, where at the end of the campaign, if you got all the victory, you would fail this. So you're going to lose probably like one to three points, depending on how many locations are like that. But this is still what I think will be the largest quantity of bonus points without giving up something elsewhere that makes it fall behind the other options. And then coming down to paths, this is uh, like you just go your own path. I don't see what the argument is for doing either of the other options. It's possible that like they've looked at the campaign and going your own path is going to cost me some point somewhere else that I haven't thought about. But at a glance, like if you don't do your own path, you don't do the epilogue. If you don't do the epilogue, you don't win. We're doing your own path, even if it wasn't worth bonus points. And then there's some reminders and stuff like this that was very helpful for planning out our run. Now, coming over to the characters we're planning, for our final Kluber, we're planning on bringing a Mandy Thompson. I covered this in the serial video, but if you're playing without Taboo because of the competitive edge it offers, Mandy Thompson is going to get more out of that removal of Taboo than anyone else. If you were to flip Taboo back and forth on this page, you will get the distinct impression Taboo was printed to fix this character, like something Mandy did was the problem. Now, I trust Mandy to handle three players' clues on her own, to be honest, but the more clues we get, the faster we finish scenarios and the less problems accrue. There's more chances that a vengeance enemy is a problem. There's more chances that we have something cascade and somebody dies and takes a trauma. There's more chances that somebody puts a doom on a location and loses a fourth of a point. The more clues you get, the better. So we're not going to be slacking on clues just because untabooed Mandy is here. For the Flex character in the group, it's going to be Flex Mark Harrigan. And surprisingly, I'm not playing either of these characters despite loving both of them to bits. Flex Mark Harrigan offers the best like action compression in the game by spending three charges on a runic axe to get three clues, one shot an enemy, and can't auto fail because of strong arm. In addition, they can contribute any skill they have and they run all of the neutral skills to any test with bestow resolve. To give plus four to any test, cycle their deck, it's just incredibly strong. Even without any of this stuff online, Mark Harrigan's still playing winging it with Sophie and Perception to test at basically six to Shroud for two clues. Mark Harrigan's very, very good as a flex character, one of the strongest characters in the game in my opinion. And for somebody who's going to meaningfully help with the elite enemies, and maybe even handle them entirely if we need him to, like this deck can do that, especially with like a Necronomicon Mandy helping out on the damage front, that's not a problem. We realize then that we haven't handled Vengeance at all. The third character has to handle Vengeance, and we're kind of feeling like we don't really need a main fighter. So then we got into this rabbit hole where we're like, what's the best character at evading? Well, if you evade them, that only deals with the snakes temporarily. So Kaimani is the permanent solution. Kaimani can just play a second flex investigator, help with clues, deal with vengeance. Mark deals with the non-vengeance enemies. And we were almost ready to lock in Kaimani. Mark, Mandy, Kaimani makes a ton of sense. It was a really good team comp. And then like right at the end, we went through all of the cards that got tabooed to see if we were getting anything in a deck or if it affected who we picked. 
and we found something that had just like went over our heads that we we just don't think about this character really. Shadow Light got moved onto the taboo list. It's level zero again when we're playing without it. And we remembered, is it difficulty zero how Parallel Pete gets his clues? And Parallel Pete, with barricades, hiding spots, and makeshift traps, is better at dealing with vengeance enemies than anyone else in the game. Because the only thing better than dealing with them permanently for one action is dealing with them permanently for basically nothing, which is what on your own Parallel Pete hiding spot or makeshift trap or barricade is doing. Parallel Pete is hands down the best manager of Vengeance you can possibly use. After dealing with Vengeance, well, can we kill the boss? Mandy's got a Necronomicon, Mark's got a Runic Axe and Strong Armed. We can probably deal with the bosses, even Yig, we're not really worried about it. So if I don't need to deal any damage, I just build the best Shed of Light, Old Key Ring, Difficulty Zero Clooper I can with the rest of my deck. And this character will just about carry its weight on clues. I think it'll actually do a little bit more than carry its weight, but the main thing is I'm just here to make vengeance not happen. And a huge powder to that is just the guitar. There are a ton of non-hunter enemies in Forgotten Age where Pete plays the guitar and basically as a lightning bolt, you just killed them. For instance, the one health, three fist, three fight snake that poisons you for vengeance one that's in the first two scenarios. Actually, it's only in the second scenario in Return 2, but still, that's a common enemy, it's in the first scenario. Pete starts with a card in play that just basically kills the snake. It's really, really good. This is single-handedly the reason we're picking Pete. The fact the rest of the deck is pretty good is the rest of the reason, but Pete is going to be here as our Vengeance counter tech. Mark is here to make sure we're capable of killing elite enemies. This is his level zero deck. This is the one I meant to click on and then get a ton of clues and give us Mythos Resilience while doing it. And then our actual clover is Mandy, running a Necronomicon, not just because it's generally busted and means she has a ton of draw and can pass any test, but also because it's going to let her flex fight and help with the big enemies. I'm looking at you, Yig. Because yeah, Yig's hard to kill. When you use Knowledge is Power, Knowledge is Power, Sleight of Hand, and then Hard Cast for three uses of the Four Secrets ability to deal nine damage as a Lightning Bolt, and then you dodge it with segmented bonics as pendant of the queen form. You know, Yig's a lot less troublesome when he instantly takes nine damage and trips. And additionally, all of Yig's ability is about synergizing with other snakes at his location. Well, I mean, between Pete's guitar and Barricade, I strongly suspect there won't be other snakes at his location. This is just a team of powerhouse characters with really, really good counterattack to this campaign. I think it makes a ton of sense. I'm very happy the characters we picked. And now I'm gonna go into our starter deck. So I'm gonna start with Parallel Pete because it's got some notes specifically on what our provisions are, what our supplies are being spent on. We're all taking provisions. We think that we'll end up losing points somewhere from having bad scenarios if we don't. We're taking Chalk because we have to. We're taking a blanket on Mark because Mark really can't afford to take a ton of traumas. He's not even taking it in the thick of it. We're taking two medicines because again, we really just don't think you can avoid getting poisoned. It's going to happen. And this is because there's nothing for two that we really cared about. That's why we're really going for the double medicine. We're taking binoculars on Mark, this of which giving someone a trauma, but more importantly, gives us Mark an extra two experience. Mark really, really wants to get the Runic Axe eight experience version, and then in addition, two strong arms immediately first upgrade. You can do that with just 10. If we fail to get two experience on the first scenario, though, we're not really planning on that in our test campaign just now. We easily managed that with bad RNG. We were shocked how well it went, but regardless, Binoculars is really good for getting Mark two additional experience because it gets him closer to the critical mass where everything is going faster. Because Part of it's that like you won't brand a Kithaga as a backup weapon to throw away to the mandatory crypt chills in the deck in Forgotten Age. Another part of it is just like every experience you get gets you closer to bestow resolve, closer to really fulfilling the support Mark role. So it's going on to Mark for those reasons. And then for Ashcan, somebody needs chalk, I needed food. And the compass is here because we didn't really know what to do with our last two experience or two supplies rather. It was hard to really pinpoint exactly what it was best spent on. And we settled on compass because compass makes a very difficult location in the first scenario into a trivial location. We could have bought two provisions. We could have bought medicine. And I'm still going back and forth on this, right? Like this is pre-planning. We haven't done anything. We just like did a test scenario one. We're going to test up to boundary beyond before we like really lock in any of our plans other than the characters. 
And I think Coppice is the right call. It might be better off as two provisions. It might be better off as... Because we run two Shadow Light and Pendant of the Queen, right? We can just, like, take the clues from another location. But there are multiple difficult locations in Scenario 1, and having Compass to just deal with one of them felt pretty good. As for the level 0 deck, I'm taking two of out of Crossroads. Mark has to find Runic Axe, Mandy has to find Mr. Rook, and this character has to find Shadow Light. So it's just really obviously what to do when I in the thick of it. And then Gumption to help enable the Shadow Light. I run two copies of Scrounds for Supplies and Short Supply, because this deck has to find Hiding Spot. At level 0, this is the only way I have of like fulfilling my job of the enemy manager for things that have Hunter, or for things that are spawning on top of us. So I have to find this pretty much immediately. This is the most consistency you can build towards that goal. After that, what else am I running? Lucky for Mythos Resilience, Guts Manual decks for Mythos Resilience, Resourceful to get Shadow Light, or if I miss Scrounge for Supplies to try to get Hiding Spot back out. Elusive for Teleporting is just very good in this campaign and in general. Kicking the Hornet's Nest is just very, very good in Pete. It's like the only economy card I'm running really in this deck because nothing I'm running costs much money at all. And then we have Safeguard because of course we do. Hallowed Mirror for safety that might even be unnecessary with an Obsidian Bracelet, but Mark will never be unhappy to have someone else use a Soothing Melody on him. And again, outside of my Shadow Light old Key Ring turns, this character can basically just chill. Just the Shadow Lights and later on the old Key Ring 3s that I use will cover my part of the clue game. Then I deal with Vengeance and everything else I do is like team support. I don't really have to play the game the whole time. This is maybe my favorite archetype of flex, and it's sort of the same archetype of flex that this Mark Harrigan deck is, where you have a lot of burst actions and a lot of dead time, and you feel like you're kind of playing the game at your own pace. I don't think there's really anything else to cover in this deck in particular. Like, there's shortcuts. It's a good card that I'm allowed to pick, so I picked it. That's the entire reason for that. So let's go over to the level zero Mark deck that I was just looking at. And it's, you know, it's a direct downgrade from the other deck. Bestow Resolve is the only real new card here. And the thing you end up cutting for Bestow Resolve is just one of your backup weapons. Because once your Runic Axe is fully upgraded, digging for it becomes a higher priority and settling for a backup weapon becomes less of an option. There's not really a lot to say about the level zero mark deck. If, I, if I've told you about in-game flex mark, I've told you about this flex mark. It really wants the upgrades on Runic Axe, and Forgotten Age is one of those campaigns where you can get it Scenario 1 if you do well. For this first scenario, it's very much just Fighter Mark with a winging it and a perception that feel kind of off. But trust me, Fighter Mark built like this is more than good enough for Scenario 1. It probably would be good enough as main fighter, period. But with Ash Can Pete taking off a lot of the pressure, this can easily main fight Scenario 1. We just saw it happen less than an hour ago when we played our test scenario. I say this as of October 1st, and I, like, it's a good deck. It's not the best fighter mark here again, but it builds into the best flex mark. Where we're really making concessions at level zero, and part of the reason we wanted to play this test campaign is, like, you look at this level zero Mandy deck, and it's, uh, it's a bit gross. Dream Diary, unupgraded, and then you have Sleight of Hand and Knowledge is Power and all you can do is sleight of hand your dream diary into play to get it triggered or play knowledge is power to get an unexpected courage and like knowledge is power as jank unexpected courage is not the worst card in the game but sleight of hand is a little bit shit and then this deck is like very able to draw bad right you have three astounding revelations three three aces three segments of onyx there's a lot of stuff you can potentially draw dead and you really want to find mr brook however very soon, Mark Harrigan has Stand Together 3. I've already got at a crossroads, and in our test game, I immediately gave it to a Mandy that drew bad. So, like, I think that in spite of the concessions this deck makes, I just saw what I felt was a bad RNG game from the Mandy with a lot of auto fails and a bad opening hand, and we ended the scenario after hitting four of six possible Ancient Evils with, I think it was three, maybe four turns to spare? Like, this is got potential for dead draws, but when you get your dead draw, what it means is you're about to finish a three aces. You're about to finish Pendant of the Queen. Bad draws eventually convert into power with this Manti deck. So the real reason for continuing is like we need to get to Boundary Beyond and see this deck in action. Not really this deck, but like this deck with a Necronomicon in it instead of a magnifying glass, right? And once we do that and we see how it feels in Boundary Beyond, we'll know like do we build for Necronomicon, or do we divert the plan a little bit with the Mandy and go into something a little bit more reliable? You don't need to play three aces. You don't need to play Necronomicon. You can make a more consistent deck that just uses magnifying glasses and Milan's and plays a more traditional game for a Kluver. 
But if this Necronomicon stuff is as consistent and powerful as it looks like it is, and the taboo list sure makes it sound like that's the case, then we want to do this. This is a big part of why we're doing the test campaign, it's just seeing, does this level zero deck work in scenario one? How strong are we in Boundary Beyond? And so far it's been going really well. I don't think I'm planning on uploading any videos about this specific team other than like an overview at the end of the campaign, but I will probably upload like some videos if there's a specific scenario I'm planning for where I think something really interesting is happening. And I'll show you some of like the prep stuff I've done already where I was looking at the maps and trying to figure things out. It looks like when I was recording this video the first time, I actually forgot to mention optimizing weaknesses. And I think that's something that a lot of people aren't really gonna think about enough when they're making their teams. Let me hop into TTS and show you what I'm talking about. So when you're playing in the Hunters of the Most Challenge, everyone on your team has to have a different weakness. And you have three options when you pick your weakness. There are two weaknesses from Forgotten Age, Dark Pact and Doomed. You can just pick either of those, you don't have to roll. Or you can roll randomly from the core set weaknesses. And I think people who don't really plan for this are making a pretty grievous mistake. So on our team, Mandy is getting Dark Pact. Let me go grab the other part of Dark Pact, what's it called, the Price of Failure? So of the choosable weaknesses, Doom just kills you. Nobody's picking Doomed, get that out of here. But Dark Pact, whoops. Dark Pact just sits in your hand and at the end of the scenario, you hit a teammate for two and you're done. It's super, super soft, it's not a problem. If you can't, then next scenario, you get the price of failure. It'll trigger once, it'll be Ancient Evils, and it'll deal 2-2 two, two to you, and that's rough, but then it just goes back to being Dark Pact. Dark Pact is actually really soft. So you wanna take Dark Pact on whoever the highest draw character that's gonna see their weakness the most is. In our case, that's definitely Mandy. They're the most important, they're gonna see their weakness the most, we have to give this to Mandy to ensure that she doesn't get bricked. Now, when you look at the weaknesses you have as an option when you roll random core set, None of these enemies are that bad. Having them in a high draw clover would be pretty shit because then their turn would get bricked if they drew into them. Again, make sure your seeker is getting dark packed. And then of these other weaknesses, you have three options that are pretty soft for everyone. Hypochondria, Psychosis, and Haunted are just really not that bad. However, there are two options that are catastrophic. There's a one in four chance of hitting Amnesia or Paranoia. And frankly, Amnesia is the much worse card unless you're playing specifically big money. When we were trying to figure out what to do with our weaknesses because of how brutal the core set roll is, we were actually joking, like, so if Mark rolls Amnesia, do we just retire him scenario one and, like, make someone else immediately? Because that's how devastating it feels. I think that planning your weaknesses is really important. For our team, I think it's really important that Mark rolls first to have the lowest possible chance of hitting Amnesia. As Pete, if I hit Amnesia, that sucks. It's gonna really hurt me. But I will continue to function in a way that Mark Harrigan might not. Like, as Pete, I can vomit out the few cards I need to use except for one trap pretty aggressively if I hit Amnesia. As Mark, the whole Bestow Resolve thing sort of falls apart with this. So we have to have Mark pick first to maximize his odds of hitting any other weakness. And then we have Pete pick and we're really hoping that like none of this matters and you just get two of these, right? That's what you want to happen. But odds are pretty solid that one of your core weaknesses ends up being one of these and somebody's deck plan gets really messed up. I genuinely think that if we roll Amnesia on Mark, the right play is to retire Mark or to completely abandon building into Bestow Resolve. That's probably more likely what we do. Instead of building Bestow Resolve, we just build into like all the other draw cards, anything that you can vomit out quickly. Like, don't put any draw in your deck that's not getting value because you're just going to be drawing towards Amnesia. It's going to be deck warping. Planning around getting the right weaknesses is important. And I think the most important part of that is not like just having the people most vulnerable roll first to maximize their odds of getting anything else, but making sure your Seeker takes Dark Pact. Dear God, is that important. So this screenshot is actually of an adjusted version of the exploration map I made. Because every time I've looked at the map physically, I was like, I don't know how this shit connects. And every time I've used the explore token that you get, that's what this is edited from. And tabletop sim, it's like kind of all janky and like laid out in a confusing way where it's, you know, it's meant to look like a jungle. It's not symmetrical and even like this. But I was trying to make sense of the map and I realized like, oh, this map is really symmetrical and makes sense. You start here, there are no clues. You go to the first row, there are clues but no victory. Then you go to the next row, there's one victory, and then you go to the last row, that's two victory. 
and everything just connects in like a very symmetrical fashion. And this isn't like super helpful realistically, while this makes it easier for me to visualize the map for map one. Since you want to get all the clues everywhere, it's very much just a case of like, get all the clues, explore. And knowing this is only really helpful because you want to know the map going into anything with explore to avoid completely wasting an action. This is the other thing I made where I was like doing some basic prep. As I've mentioned, we were like specifically talking about Boundary Beyond in the first scenario, that's why I've got stuff for those already. In the Boundary Beyond, the map changes as you switch from present to past. And the way it changes is that there's just a connecting ring along the outside of this map. And I rearranged the map into a way where one, the ring was connected directly, and two, none of the connections were overlapping. That's what the rearranged map here that is not what the campaign suggests you at all is showing. The next thing is we realize you never want to explore a location if other people are with you. There is really devastating explore reveal effects where you do not want to have a chance of that happening, in particular at these two locations with the red circles around them. And then the color indicates the difficulty of the initial explore action because you don't start them with them face up. You have to go to them to see how bad they are. And as much as I can memorize a lot of random shit in this game, the specific bad reveal effects and bad explore effects is something I can't commit to memory. Arranging the map like this, I can commit to memory. Knowing that the middle locations are green and easy and the top locations are yellow and kinda hard, that I can remember. Remembering these two in the bottom corners are really, really bad explore effects, that I can remember. In this case, Zocalo requires you to discard five costs of cards from your hand as an action to explore, which is something so bad that our scenario prep notes are like going in the scenario four, Mandy just needs to buy extensive research so she can throw it away to explore as a one action, one discard explore. Cause like Mark's deck is dirt cheap. Ash can's Pete, <laughs> Ash can Pete's deck literally doesn't cost anything. We have to have Mandy just buy a random expensive card to explore this place and preferably two copies of it cause you can fail. And that's also part of the point of the highlighting of this. You want to explore at green locations first. When these locations have Mythos cards that are forcing you to flip back to the present, you want to flip these locations. That's part of why this planning is so important, is because if you are playing it randomly, if you don't know how it works, that's why the scenario feels so bad. You go to a yellow corner first, you get some brutal reveal effect on your explored location where everyone discards cards in their hands, and then you get a Mythos card where it flips back over and you have to do the difficult explore action again. That's why it feels so random and volatile is because we're playing without perfect information. And if you can find a way to a, like set down the map where you remember at least broadly what it is, that's how you're going to be able to fix it. Having this triangle with the weird broken connections on the side of the box over here and the protruding bit here, knowing that Sokolo is the bottom right corner because it's got a weird name that I can remember and it's green, which is the rogue thing, that's stuff that I can do where we get a like clear memory and game plan going into the scenario. It like the way you win is by flipping the green locations, which are just not a problem to explore. And then when you go back to them, instead of having devastating thing happen to explore followed by devastating reveal, it's just a chill time. It's not even that much worse than normal explore action. Anyone who's like flipping these corners multiple time, that's how you're going to fail to get all six locations. You still might fail. I've never like premeditated scenarios as hard as I am for this campaign. I know that this will improve our odds of full clearing tremendously. I don't know that it makes it consistent. And I'm thinking after that first scenario, ha having seen like a bad draw on a Mandy that doesn't have Necronomicon, I think we fucking have the full clear in the bag, to be honest. But I need to get there. I need to see how this actually feels to play with new information. And I'm looking forward to this competition a lot. For Serial, it's a new and interesting thing. But part of the reason I was always really considering not playing with Taboo is I want to see like pushing characters to the limit, trying as hard as we can to really break the game. And with Serial, my plan isn't really to do that. My plan is to survive for multiple campaigns. I'm changing the rules of the game and playing differently. With this multiplayer campaign with my normal group though, this is very much just trying to break the game, just pushing it to its extremes and seeing how fast we can go and get every single clue, even the ones we don't need. Anyways, I've been Rather Incoherence. I hope you're considering signing up for the Hunters of the Mythos thing as well. 
I'm glad I made it back to content production in time to see this tournament starting and to get hyped for it and participate with it with my tabletop group. Hopefully you'll be amongst our competitors and hopefully I'm right and it will be a close race with a lot of people right at the top, very close to the point limits. I'm also really looking forward to seeing the end result and seeing like if consistently the same prowess is in like the top three groups in every category or if there's a mix of it. Because I don't really know how viable Bear Grylls is. I don't really know if I'm right about my thoughts on Snake Protection Agency. Anyways, I will ramble in circles if I let myself, so I'm going to cut it off here. I've been rather incoherent. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.